Okay, so true or false, real quick. A stroke is another name for heart attack. Okay, what did people say? Let's see what the responses were. So most of you said false, and you are correct. A stroke is it's a common misconception among people with no medical background. They think a stroke is the same as a heart attack. They're related because they involve vasculature, but it's not the same. Next question, or actually, so the next part I'm going to do is show you a video, and I want you to pay attention to what happens during the video. Okay, so here's the video I'm going to show you here. What did you notice in that woman? What happened to her? So you will select three of these things because they're mutually exclusive, but where did the stroke happen and what happened to her when she had the stroke? When I used to show this video in person, some people are like, that's scary, but I think it does a really good job of showing what the symptoms of a stroke looks like and why it tells you a great mnemonic on why time is critical. Okay, so let's see how people responded. So let me have to expand this window a bit. So most of you said that she had a stroke on the right side of the brain, and you are correct. But the interesting thing is that most of you were correct that her left face started drooping. So her right side had that stroke, but her left sit, the opposite side drooped, and she actually dropped that tea for whatever she was drinking from her left arm. And you might be like, wait, she had it on the right. Why did it drop from the left? Well, if you remember your nervous system, and if you were here last semester with AMP1, you might remember that the descending pathways and the motor pathways, what they do is that decussation, they cross over. So if you have brain damage on one side of the brain, it's going to affect motor control of the opposite side of the body. So that's why if someone had like a left side weakness or paralysis, and again, we have a lot of muscles involved in speech as well. That's why she was having trouble speaking as well. That's why I think it's a scary video for some, but it's a great example of showing you what a stroke might look like and how it affects somebody. And if you don't save enough of those brain cells in time, somebody can be permanently disabled or like if you're like my grandpa, he was actually... He actually had a stroke and he was in the shower and then my grandma until she didn't realize that he had something until she found out like hey he's taking a shower way too long and then found out so all that time he was having that stroke and brain cells were dying so he was permanently wheelchair chair bound for the rest of his life so that's why it's important to act fast if you recognize the symptoms of a stroke so what are the symptoms of a stroke there were a lot covered in that video but stroke symptoms so that face, face drooping and again, that's why I think that CGI is scary, but it really was dramatic because it showed that face drooping. So this one's a little more subtle, and you can tell that it's kind of like uneven, but the, compared to that a CGI example, that's like really obvious. But asymmetry and arm weakness, because again, if you affect one side of the brain and that stroke is affecting one side, that's going to affect all the motor control on the opposite side of the body. Slurred speech, because again, we need muscles to speech and produce sounds and talk. So if one side of our face is paralyzed, it becomes harder to form our words like we normally do. And then trouble seeing, walking, and understanding. So remember that you have motor control, but also sensory input into your brain as well. So if you have both sensory and motor control being affected in term, in, by a stroke, it's going to affect both your receiving knowledge and also or receiving information and interpreting that information and also doing actions as well. So well, a stroke is also called a cerebrovascular accident. So not the same as a myocardial infarction. But what strokes are, they're not affecting the heart, but they're affecting the brain. So they're affecting, it sounds like infecting, but they're affecting the brain. So this is impaired blood flow. So remember blood flow is perfusion and carrying everything that your cells need to keep alive. So if you impair and block that blood flow, it can result in cell death in the brain. And thus, this is ischemic stroke, is a type of stroke, the most common one, and it's caused by blockage and inadequate blood flow to the brain tissue. So if you don't have blood flow to the brain tissue, again, this is why it's important to act fast, because the more, the sooner you can intervene, the less, the less your brain cells and tissues are starved of oxygen and they can keep alive. They, the, I mean, that time is of the essence. The longer they suffocate from this ischemia, then the more cells die and the less of the person you save. There's also hemorrhagic stroke, and this is caused by blood, the blood vessels in, that supply the brain. Many of them, and that's why it's kind of like, I expect you to know all the blood vessels in the brain at this beginning level, 
But if you look at the pictures of the blood flow to the brain, notice that there's a lot of blood vessels and branches to the brain. It just shows you how important blood flow is to the brain. So what can happen in a hemorrhagic stroke, you may be like, wait, so bleeding, but now the blood's going everywhere. Well, think of it this way. If you have your house and the water main breaks, and, the, and breaks before the water gets to your house, is your house going to get, or apartment or dorm, going to get water? No. So again, everything downstream of the break is not going to be supplied with water. Same with a hemorrhagic stroke. Everything downstream that's past the initial hemorrhage and that blood vessel rupture is not going to get a uh, blood supply. The other bad thing is that, or maybe I can cover, I'd cover this in future, like in the next slides. But yeah, if you remember like, Luke Perry, I think that was like two years ago, yeah, or four or three years ago, actually, three years ago. Yeah, so he died pretty well. I know if some of you are like 50, that's not young, but that's relatively young for, I mean, when we, our average life expense, expectancy is around 70 and 80, that's relatively young. But he died of ischemic stroke. And what happens is that it's kind of like that. So it's similar to a heart attack in terms of like you have a clogged blood vessel but it's a different organ being affected. So what we have here is like a disease artery that's very narrow. And then there, in this example of ischemic stroke, we have a blood clot lodging in there and then causing that stroke. So it's kind of like a stuffed up pipe. That blocks flow, and if you block the flow, then everything downstream of that flow is not going to get everything that the blood supplies. So that's why ischemic stroke, one way to provide that is things like heparin, warfarin, anticoagulants, something that are like TPA, that clot buster, that something that helps to prevent, dissolve those clots and get rid of it so that you can restore blood flow to that area. Or you might use, need to use a stent. Some, the main thing is get that vessel open because it's blocked up and the brain cells and brain tissue that are downstream of that stroke are being starved. Yeah, so the, if you remember like Luke Perry from like Riverdale before it got super crazy, like that rocket episode, I was like, okay, I'm out. I can't deal with this, <laughs> the craziness anymore. But yeah, tragic because again, that was what, that's what he died of. Hemorrhagic stroke. So this is why it's also called, remember that hemorrhage refers to bleeding, right? So what's happening is that's why it's also called brain bleed because now you have a blood vessel burst in the brain and now that blood is spilling down out of that blood vessel and therefore everything downstream and that was supplied by that downstream of that break in the blood vessel is not going to get adequate blood supply. But the other thing is, so this is why I covered aneurysms because these are a common cause of hemorrhagic stroke. I mean, you can have like other traumas that can break blood vessels, but if you have an aneurysm and it bursts, it's just like having a leak in a pipe system. Then that affects the water supply and pressure to downstream areas or everything that was being supplied by that, that pipe. So what happens is that, okay, blood leaks out due to, often due to aneurysm. But then what happens is that it's not just about starving the downstream tissues of blood, but you're also going, where is that blood going to go? It's going to go to the surrounding tissues of the brain. So that's going to cause increased fluid in your cranial cavity and inside that surrounding your brain. And eventually that's going to cause increased pressure in the tissues of the brain itself. So that's also going to increase pressure is also going to affect not only the brain cells and subject to mechanical stresses, but it's also going to shut off other, so if you have like a blood vessel and you start squeezing it against your heart skull, that's going to cut off more blood vessels. So due to all that fluid accumulating in that hemorrhagic stroke, that's going to cause massive amount, massive amount of cell death and damage. So that's why it not, it's not about a clot anymore. Now it's about just like repairing that burst pipe. So you have to find a way to repair that vessel, but you also have to deal with all that increased pressure and all that fluid that accumulated. And if you remember things like transfusion reactions or hemolytic transfusion reactions and how if you have like burst blood cells, they cause all those laundry lists of symptoms. Same with all the leftover blood cells that are left over in the brain after a hemorrhagic stroke. That causes a second wave of all these symptoms and harmful just stuff. I mean, I mean, there's a laundry list of this stuff. I don't expect you to know over this class, but it's like bad news for the brain. Strokes are bad news for the brain, period. So again, this is dis different from ischemic stroke because again, ischemic stroke is something getting clogged up, but hemorrhagic, now everything's, the floodgates have to be opened, something burst.
So ischemic strokes are the majority of the cases, like the one that took out Archie Andrews' father, right? But hemorrhagic stroke is only one over like yeah, only 13% of stroke cases, so very small minority of that. So there are subtypes, I don't expect you to know this, but I want you to look at the terms like intracerebral, well inside the brain, right? Or and then we have or cerebrum more specifically. And then we have subdural subarachnoid. And if you remember your meninges from the nervous system, that sounds like the dura mater and mater and the arachnoid mater. And where is CSF? In that subarachnoid layer, right? So this is where hemorrhagic stroke, what we have is like, okay, sometimes you can have it within the brain itself, or you can have this bleeding within the different layers of the meninges that surround the brain. So that's what you should, I will hope you can appreciate yet. Yeah with this. I don't expect you to know those percentages, but just FYI. Okay, so is the heart attack the same thing as a stroke? Totally different organs, so they're not the same. So a heart attack is not a stroke, but they share common features. So that's why I'm trying to... So again, this is something that's why less commonly you might hear the term brain attack. So that's a way of thinking of like myocardial infarction versus a cerebrovascular accident. So Myocardial infarction is a heart attack. A cerebro cerebrovascular accident is a brain attack. So different organs, but they share common mechanisms. So what's happening is that, well, your heart has a blood supply and so does your brain. They're very important organs. That's what they have in common. But ischemia is the common underlying mechanism on, in both. Or actually, or assuming it's ischemic stroke. So what happens is that your tissues that were supplied by that blood vessel that's being clogged up, it's now no longer has access to oxygen, nutrients, and everything else it needs. And then this occurs in the majority of stroke cases. Again, this is ischemic strokes are different from hemorrhagic strokes. But in ischemia, what happens is that some artery gets cl clogged up and blocked. So in myocardial infarction, it's the artery supplying the heart walls and myocardium of the heart. Whereas in a cerebrovascular accident, it's some artery that supplies the brain. So this is what they share in common. So again, myocardial infarction versus a cerebrovascular accident. So different organs, but they share things like something blocking a blood artery, and then you have ischemia. So now tissues are being deprived of perfusion and a blood supply, and you have cell death of these tissues. And these are vital organs, right? So this is why it's, they are potentially deadly if you don't intervene in, in time. Okay. So what's the difference between a heart HS and hemorrhagic stroke and ruptured aneurysm? So a ruptured aneurysm can cause a hemorrhagic stroke, but aneurysms can occur at tec technically any vessel, more specific, more commonly in any artery. So you can actually have aneurysms like even on your aorta. So ruptured aneurysms in the brain can lead to hemorrhagic stroke. But again, ruptured aneurysms, they can, in theory, develop anywhere. So. Yeah, it's about location in terms of like having a stroke, the brain. Okay, next section. All right, so now let's talk about the other vessels. So vasodilation and vasoconstriction. Now what we have here is a cross section of a muscular artery. And remember those tunicas we talked about. So again, remember if you do a cross section of a vessel, it will look like a circle. So vasoconstriction. So when you think of like a boa constrictor, what's it going to do? It's going to eat what it eat whatever its prey is and constrict and squeeze. Same with constriction and vasoconstriction. Vaso referring to vessel. Now the vessels are going to constrict. So what's going to happen is that tunica media and is the very very muscular layer full of smooth muscle and remember that when muscle contracts it shortens and it squeezes right so if you have a circular muscle what happens when it shortens it's going to contract therefore that diameter of that vessel is going to decrease so that's what we have with vasoconstriction now vasodilation pretty much the polar opposite instead of contraction now you have relaxation of this tunica media and if you relax the smooth muscle of this vessel it's going to increase the vessel diameter. So that's what we have there. And then with muscular arteries, so they're very important in vasoconstriction because, because of all that smooth muscle, they can change their diameter very readily by either the relaxing or contracting. 
So what happens is that if you change the diameter, that causes changes in blood flow throughout that through that muscular artery. So I like to like my analogy is like it's like a garden hose. Like if you have a garden hose and you don't have it blocked up, it's flowing. But what happens when you put your finger over it and narrow it very slightly? That's going to cause it to increase that pressure, right? And now you can square it. Like if you played with this as a kid, like you're watering the lawn and then you have your sibling and then you put your you do that to the hose and you squirt your sibling and then they complain to mom and dad, not speaking from experience. But smaller vessel diameter is going to increase the pressure. So that's why you have that able by narrowing that water hose, it kind of increases the pressure and now the water shoots out far further and at a faster speed. Uh, opposite is also true. If you relax it, that's going to ease up on the pressure. So it's not going to shoot as far if you have that guard hose once you release that smaller diameter. Or it's like when you say you eat, eat a lot and then you're wearing tight pants and a belt. And what happens when you undo the belt and undo and ease up on the diameter of your belt? You relieve the pressure as well, right? So that's one way your muscular arteries can adjust pressure by constricting or relaxing. Now, with diplo the, it's not just about pressure, just re uh, regulating pressure, but the thing about these vessels that have smooth muscle, they're also important in directing where blood goes. So vasoconstriction can also control the distribution of blood because which is easier to pass through, a very narrow doorway or a very wide open doorway or no doorway at all. So vasoconstriction, the narrower it is, the more narrow a blood vessel is, the harder it is for blood to pass through. So there is kind of a trade-off. You increase the pressure, but you also slow things down. Now, when you activate the sympathetic nervous system, what happens to blood flow? Does it stay the same throughout your body? Well, if you remember your autonomic nervous system in the sympathetic division, when you have sympathetic activity, that causes blood flow to go to certain organs, but it also takes away blood flow and cuts off blood flow to other organs. So what's it going to do? Remember that the opposite, or I shouldn't say opposite, but the division that works with the sympathetic nervous system is the parasympathetic nervous system. So remember that sympathetic nervous system is fight or flight. Parasympathetic is rest and digest. Well, with sympathetic, you don't want to rest and digest. So you're going to cut off or restrict blood flow, not completely because you don't want to cause ischemia but you're going to slow down blood flow to the gastrointestinal tract, so premature organs that help in digestion. And what are you going to do? Well, remember that it's that fight, flight, fight or flight or fright or freeze, that sympathetic activity. So you want increased blood flow to your skeletal muscles. And again, a classic example of sympathetic activity is exercise. During exercise, you want your skeletal muscles filled with a lot of oxygen and blood and nutrients, so it makes sense to divert more blood away from your digestive organs and go to your skeletal muscles. So I like this, like I love this meme, but this is an example of what the sympathetic activity does to it. So this is your GI tract, and this is your skeletal muscle, and this is your blood right here. What sympathetic activity going to do? It's going to vasoconstrict, so it's going to block off the blood vessel or slow down the blood flow toward your GI tract. And where is the blood going to go? Well, if you block off these blood vessels leading to GI tract, now the blood is going to flow to your skeletal muscles. So this is why vasoconstriction is not only important in regulating pressure, but also regulating where and directing where blood goes in your body. And another part about vasoconstriction is that it's important in thermal regulation or maintaining your body's temperature. So remember that 92% of your, or at the bla your plasma is water, I should say but water also absorbs heat. So the water is a good absorption. That's why we sweat, and that's why when it evaporates, we cool off as well. So water is very important in distributing heat throughout our body. So what happens is in cold temperature, you might notice that in, like in the previous lectures and slides, when you have a cold temperature, you might notice that you lose color in your fingertips or toes and extremities. And why is that? Well. This is your body, your, your, all the, your blood vessels constricting and redirecting blood away from your extremities and toward your organs. Because again, this is, or in this very ex extreme examples, yeah, you see a total blanching because of a lack of blood. And this person, like now we have some of these cells and t the fingertips dying because they've been 
starved of oxygen and they're also don't have as they don't have heat as well to keep them alive as well so they're lo they're losing all the things they need to keep alive in these tissues so this is why we get frostbite because again this is the vasoconstriction saying like okay we like our fingers but which is which is worse losing a finger or losing an organ inside your abdomen and thorax yeah you want to keep your organs healthy right so this is why we have that loss from periphery and we have a move, our blood moving more toward our proximal area, our trunk and head because we want to keep our brain and all our organs inside our trunk alive, right? So this is why we have that frostbite happening in cold temperatures. But that's also why we have vasodilation and why we have like flushing of our, like if you go, if you're like me and you have rosacea triggered by heat, what happens is that you get really red and really blotchy and flushed and why is that? Well, thing is that if you want to if you want to stay warm in a cold temperature, you're going to bring blood closer toward the inside of your body. The opposite is also true. If you want to cool off, you want to move blood to the the outside of your body so now the heat can can radiate from the water and cool you off. So this is why we turn red or some people like me turn red if we're exposed to hot temperatures because of that vasodilation instead of constriction. Now arterioles, this, these are smaller than so they're not the same as arteries but let's look at the arterial compared to an elastic and muscular artery. So you notice that compared they don't have all three layers to the same extent as the elastic and muscular artery. So there's barely any, or sometimes no tunica externa, and very thin tunica media. So they're pretty much all just endothelium, that inner layer of cells, and smooth muscle cells. So not really a tunica externa, they're mostly muscle. So you have smooth muscle plus endothelium, and this is why they're called resistance vessels, because now, because they're mostly muscle, you can either pinch them off by constricting those muscle cells or you can restore blood flow by relaxing them. That's why they're called resistance because you can resist blood flow by pinching and constricting or you can restore things by opening up again. And now to our next section. Okay, so now let's talk about capillaries. So here we have arteries, arterioles, and capillary beds. And I'm not sure, maybe it was like that very broad scheme or like that initial picture I showed at the very beginning of the vascular, cardiovascular section. Somewhat, I know one student said like, is there only one capillary bed? No, there are multiple capillary beds throughout your body. This is just showing you the example of one of them. And notice that the arteries, these are the like, the freeways are very big and they're, they're very wide. Arterioles are relatively narrow. And again, they don't have that big tunica externa and they're mostly tunica media and the uh, intima. And then these capillaries, they're very, very narrow and notice that they branch off into even smaller vessels as well. Now, what we have here is an example of a capillary bed. They don't show, this isn't what they all look like, but it's just showing you the different components that can be present in a capillary bed. But I want, what I want you to see is like, okay, capillaries, these are the smallest blood vessels in terms of diameter. But they, they're very important because why? They connect the arteries and veins. So again, arteries are carrying blood away from the heart and veins return it. But these are where things are, the transition between arteries and veins. Now, by being small, that's very important in their function and how they're in circulation and your cardiovascular system. So capillary beds, these are referring to, so notice that it's not just one single capillary from artery to vein. You actually have multiple small capillaries, and when you have a network of these capillaries, they're called a capillary bed. Now, there's something else called a precapillary sphincter, and a sphincter is a ring of muscle. So this also comes useful when we talk about the digestive system. But basically what it is is like a ring of smooth muscle, and remember muscle contracts and relaxes. So by doing that, it can pinch off or restore blood flow to the capillary bed. So these sphincters are also very important in regulating and directing blood flow. Now, let's look at where they might be in a capillary bed. So here we actually have like cr multiple cross sections. Like if you take a donut and then cut it like this way, what happens is you see those like, you'll, if you have half a donut, you notice like I have only like little, little circles. That's what we're seeing over here. But for simplicity's sake, let's just say the precapillary sphincters are over here.
So they look like little donuts, and what happens when they constrict? Well, they're going to narrow and get smaller and smaller in diameter. If they get small enough, they might not even have like an internal diameter, or they might, so that would prevent anything from flowing through. But right now they're open, so they're allowing blood to flow through. What happens if we constrict them and cause, cause them to contract? Well, it's kind of like this, like what happens if you divert traffic? It flows to another area, right? So what we're going to do is close these precapillary sphincters. And what is that going to do from blood, with blood flow from this arterial over here? Well, now that's going to constrict and cut off blood flow to this area. So just like that traffic diversion, it's going to divert traffic away from where we, pre we previously had access and move it toward another pathway. So what's happening is that now blood flow, instead of going through this capillary bed, is going to go to this, in this case, an arterial venous anastomosis. I know that's a, I'm surprised I pronounced that correctly. But anastomosis is some sort of bridge between blood vessels. So what we're seeing is that instead of, it's kind of like a bypass sort of way. So instead of having to go through like, or like if you're trying, if you're here in an island and you're instead of like traveling through Waikiki, you just go on like take the H1 or take another route on Wailei or some, th some other main road besides going through a neighborhood. That's kind of like that. You're going through another lane that allows you to bypass an entire neighborhood. That's what these arterial venous, venous anastomoses are kind of like. They're kind of like some way of bypassing the narrow roads of a neighborhood. But with a continuous capillary, so continuous meaning that, so what I want you to see is that these are all these cell endothelial cells that line a capillary, but in a continuous capillary, there are no real breaks between them. So the interesting thing about this is this endothelium of a continuous capillary is continuous with the tunica intima of the arter arterioles and venules that lead to and from them and there's no tunica media or externa and that's very so this is why capillaries are also very fragile tunica externa is very important in maintaining the overall structure of a vessel but if you don't have an outer protection or support of a tunica externa it makes the vessel very fragile now thinner walls mean increased diffusion so increased diffusion of things like water solutes small and actually there are things called endosomes here, over here these little bubbles so these can also help to ferry things in and across this membrane as well. So think of it this way, like is it easier to cross a single, like a two, two lane street or a highway? By the way, don't try to cross a highway. I think that's illegal in most places <laughs> by, uh, by foot unless there's overpass. But again, it's easier to cross a thinner membrane and thinner, thinner, uh, thinner strip of membrane than it is to go cross a very thick layer. So by have be capillaries being very thin, allows for easy exchange of materials between the inside of a capillary and the blood and the surrounding tissues that are surrounding this capillary. Now, which moves faster? So back to, this is why I like to use analogies between like between pipes and our vessels and also traffic because if you've been on a highway, what happens and then you cut it. So here's a highway, no, no, no obstructions, no accidents. But say there's an accident or, you know, if you've ever been driving, <laughs> if you've ever been, been driving here in Hawaii or like what, do you see cones being blocking off and then there's no construction, there's no like, there's no maintenance people around this and they're not even working but they do like block it off like three miles in advance and it's like, and what happens to traffic when you block off these lanes? Well, traffic typically slows down, right? So. The fewer lanes open, the slower the flow. The more lanes open, the faster the flow. Same with these capillaries. So blood moves at the slowest rate through capillaries. And why am I showing you this example on the right? So this is kind of like how a capillary is. Because the diameter, the lumen of a capillary is about the same as a red blood cell. So red blood cells are just barely fit into capillary, so they go single file through these smallest capillaries. So they're very slow, but the thing about this is that by having this very slow blood flow, it also allows more time for things like the oxygen from hemoglobin to diffuse from the red blood cells into the surrounding tissue. So think of it this way, it's like, which would you rather get if you're trying to commute to UH and drive to UH? Would you rather get out of a car that's moving at two miles per hour or a car that's moving 60 miles per hour?
yeah, you don't really have time to <laughs> hit the ground running if you're moving very fast. So that is an advantage of the capillary slowing things down. By having more time to diffuse and slowly, or by having more time in the capillaries and slowing things down, there's more time for things to exchange between the blood and the cells in, within the blood and the surrounding tissues. So even though blood flow is slow, it allows for more efficient, if, efficient loading and unloading of materials between the blood and the surrounding tissues. All right, so let's go to, so there are other types of capillaries. So there's fenestrated and sinusoid capillaries. Okay, so this fenestration, or if you know Latin or French, like fenetra is window. So there's these small pores, and what they'll do is like, okay, now the capillaries, they have small little pukas, these small little holes. So these allow bigger particles to go through, but they're not so big that they allow cells in these fenestrated capillaries. So these are these little pores, and but they still keep cells alive. So why is that? Well, if the pores are bigger, remember, just like the capillaries themselves, the bigger an opening, the more flow you have. So you might want to introduce these small holes that allow faster diffusion, but not enough so that allows cells to leak through. Now, sinusoid capillaries, they have larger gaps. So sometimes they actually allow larger particles or sometimes even cells to transfer through. So sinusoid is like the biggest type of gaps. Fenestrated are smaller gaps and then continuous minimal gaps or no gaps. So capillaries are exchange vessels because they're meant to exchange things between the blood and the surrounding tissues. Okay, next section. Okay, so veins, so veins collect blood from the capillaries. So what they do is like, remember arteries move blood away from the heart, veins return. Now, what they do, in general, veins have a larger diameter than arteries. There are multiple veins and maybe the smaller veins might have a smaller diameter, but in general, veins have a larger diameter. Like the average diameter is larger. But they also have a lower blood pressure. So diameter is very important in regulating pressure. So again, just like having a wider diameter belt or wider diameter pants, a bigger pant waist size, that also eases up on the pressure in, of the contents inside that pants, right? So same with veins, that larger diameter, lower average blood pressure. They also have thinner walls than arteries. So remember that arteries, they have to have thick walls because they deal with the most pressure on average. Veins, they deal with less pressure, so they're allowed to get away with thinner walls. Now what we have is this schematic of all the blood flow. And remember that average blood pressure is highest toward the artery or toward the arter artery side and close it, or the parts closest to the heart have the most pressure, but the further away you get from the heart, the further down the path in systemic circulation, the less pressure you have. Now notice that the veins, they have the three tunics as well. So they deal with lower pressures and they have a generally wider diameter. Now, the thing is that with lower pressures, just like this collapsed roof over here, what prevents veins from collapsing? There are multiple things that prevent it hold veins open, but what prevents them is like, one thing that helps is having a very thick tunica externa with all the collagen and elastic fibers. So that helps to bridge and maintain the structure of veins. But veins are a little more flexible because they have less pressure overall. Now, the thing about having less pressure is that there's more chance of things flowing in the opposite direction. Here we have a vein in our lower leg and calf. So by gravity, if you stand up and you didn't have these structures right here, what ha can happen is that all the blood and all the blood that's above here can actually push back down. But the thing about this is that we have things called valves, just like the valves in your heart maintain the appropriate flow and direction of blood through your heart. Valves also help to your veins to maintain flow because why? You don't really have the advantage of strong pressures pushing back blood back to the heart and the lower limbs and when you're standing upright. So these valves help to prevent that back flushing. So here's a venous valve. So again, this is going to allow, it's like a one-way door or a one-way push door. You can push this door open, but can you push a push door back in the wrong direction? Nope, it's going to shut closed, right? So this is why these venous valves are very important in maintaining it because the veins have lower pressure overall. So the other interesting thing is this is why it's also sh showing the, like the calf muscles, the gastroc and the soleus. 
because compression of muscles around veins also helps with returning blood to the heart. So this is why you may refer that sometimes they refer to the calf muscles as the second heart because by them contracting and by us move, walking around, it helps to squeeze the blood in this vein. And hey, just like the heart, it also has valves. So by flexing this muscle and squeezing, constricting, this helps to push and generate pressures that help to restore and retain blood or move blood back from our extremities and back into our central circulation. So this is why it's like, sometimes it's not official, but this is a common term for calling the legs, the calf muscles like the second heart. Now, if you've been sitting for a long time, maybe after this, le this lecture, you might want to get up. So yeah, this is pre-pandemic pre times, in the before times, no one's wearing a mask, but hopefully like in the, we can return to this where post COVID, but why should you get up and move around during a long flight, especially if it's like one of those like eight hour flights or what was it like the one to Australia, like I forgot it was like nine or 10 hours. One of those very long flights. Well, the thing is that the longer, if you have blood in anywhere and it stays stagnant and doesn't have a lot of flow and movement, you can form clots. And this is why it's important to move around because again, if you're sitting and you're not using your calf muscles, you're not helping the circulation in your lower legs. So the thing is that, yeah, it's like from the WHO, well, this is again pre-COVID, but it's but this is why they say maybe every few hours get up, walk around to get the blood circulating again. So yeah, travelers who take long flights, more than four hours in length, so that's, heck, even here to like Cali, that's like more than four hours you have an increased risk of forming a blood clot. So this is why it's good to get up. Like Even though if you're in middle, middle seat, I know it's tough. But for your own health, try to prevent that. Because why? You want to avoid what, forming what we call a deep, deep vein thrombosis or DVT. So remember, a thrombus is a blood clot. So this is something we learned in a previous lecture. But thrombosis is when this blood clot ends up blocking something. So, so you have a blood clot, but now it's going to block blood supply somewhere. So legs are a common site of DVTs, especially during long periods of inactivity. Because again, like by getting things circulating, that also helps to dilute the clotting factors and also prevents clots as well. So sitting still increases your risk of forming this DVTs. And why are they a serious matter? Well, what happens if that clot and that thrombosis ends up in your heart, in your brain, in another or vital organ? So they can result in an embolism when they block a blood vessel. And if you block that blood vessel, now you're going to starve those tissues and organs of their blood supply. So again, embolisms, this is why DVTs are very serious and you want to prevent them because you don't want ischemia happening to one of the other organs in your body. And if you've been to a hospital and know, and you may have seen this. So you might have seen these interesting things that look like socks or stockings and they're hooked up to these machines. And you might notice that these machines make this kind of sound and these things move. And what's happening is this IPC, this intermittent pneumatic compression, is that they're actually inflating these air bladders and also deflating. And what's that doing? Well, again, if someone's bedridden, they're not up and walking around. So what they're going to do with this IPC is kind of like apply pressure to simulate this because why? Well, when you squeeze, you're going to also squeeze the contents of these vessels. And by doing that, you're going to get the blood circulating. So this is why somebody who's bedridden in a hospital might have this to prevent the formation of DVTs or other clots. Now with blood, so oh man. Okay, so average adult total blood volume, so five liters. So in females, on average, is like four to five, males, five to six. And this is all just based, why is there a difference? Because it's just on average, just average size and mass and height. Like a 6'2 power lifter woman is going to have a, probably going to have much more blood volume than I am at 5'6. But again, this is just based on the average, like averages of height and mass. Okay, so heart, arteries, and capillaries. So they're very important in delivering that oxygenated blood, but they're actually only one third of approximately of these blood volume. Now, do I want you to know these exact numbers? I'm not really concerned with that. Just no general ballpark. Because it also depends with like the textbook you use. So again, 
around five liters of blood. So you should know that about ballpark. But so five liters of blood. And the heart, even though it's very important in moving the blood, it doesn't store blood. That's not the function of the heart. So the heart is there just to move the blood around. And the pulmonary circuit that goes to your lungs, that has some of your, like just under 10%. And the arterial system, 13%, and then the capillaries. So notice that this is not the majority. The majority actually is contained within the veins. So again, larger diameter also means larger volume. And about a fifth of it is something called the venous reserve. So the venous reserve is, uh, so the venous system contains most of your total blood volume. So even though it's like not going to be due to its like larger diameter overall, that's one thing that can help it to retain more blood. And the venous reserve is a subsection of that. That's 21% of your total blood volume. So again, around one fifth. Now, so if there's like, if you have five liters of blood in your, in your body, then that's around one liter. So the thing about that is that it's a network of veins that store blood in the skin, bone marrow, and liver. Because why? Well, the skin has actually a lot of blood vessels, same with the bone marrow and liver. But in case like you have something like hemorrhage, like internal hemorrhage, and you're losing a lot of blood and you might end up at risk of hypovolemic shock, if you don't have enough blood, you're not going to have enough pressure. So this is why it's important to have this venous reserve because in emergency situations, your, your skin, bone marrow, and liver can actually squeeze the blood in this venous reserve and move it back toward the organs that need it even more. So like your heart and your brain as well. And this is why when someone's in shock, that's why they also lose, or and especially hypovolemic shock, why they lose color in their skin and they look very pale because again, their skin is now squeezing the blood saying, okay, it's good to, it's nice having a nice complexion, but you're in danger here. We need your blood to go to the right organs. So this is why we see that change in color. So this is why the venous reserve is important because it allows, it's like your own, your, it's just like, or any reserve in your body. It's something that your body can mobilize in case it needs more of whatever it, the reserve is. So in this case, it's a reserve of blood. So, or just like the oil reserves. Like if we are blo or, or if we need more energy and gas and oil, then we can use our reserves or if you're like or emergency funds. If you have a like, oh, I have a like emergency, I need to use some funds. I'm going to use my reserve funds. That's what's kind of like. Uh, so cardiac output and blood flow. Okay, so cardiac output and in other textbooks, especially if you're going to med school, you they're also or and nursing school probably also uses this. Sometimes it's called Q or Q with a dot over it, depends on the textbook. But this is a variable meaning blood flow. So cardiac output, remember in the previous lecture we talked about, is heart rate times stroke volume is one way you can get cardiac output. But basically it's how much blood you pump out from your heart in one or one ventricle in one minute. So there are two main factors that affect blood flow throughout your vessels, pressure and resistance. Now what are those two? So blood flow is, a pro so this means proportional to. So a pressure drop versus, or dr pressure difference over, or sometimes called pressure gradient over resistance. So what this is, is like this Q, also called Q sometimes. But blood flow is proportional to pressure over resistance. So what happens is that if you have more pressure, so this over here, so say you double your pressure, that's going to double your blood flow. But if you double your resistance, that's going to cause it to be one over two. So that's going to half your blood flow. So this is a pro so this part right here, ignore resistance. So this is what we call proportional. If one goes up, the other goes up. If one goes down, the other goes down. But if we ignore, we keep pressure constant and we talk about resistance, notice that if we had, so flow is here, resistance is on the bottom of the, the fraction. So if this number gets bigger, just like if a fraction gets bigger, like it goes from one half to one third to one fourth to one fifth to one sixth to one tenth and so on and so on and so on, it gets smaller and smaller and smaller this, this bottom num as this, the bottom number gets bigger, right? This denominator. So this is why it's called an inverse proportion because if this gets big, this drops. If this gets smaller, then this increases. So it's an inverse proportion.
So it's often simplified, and your book uses this example as like flow is equal to pressure over resistance, or some, if you just do algebra, multiply both by resistance, pressure equals flow over resistance. Now, what generates pressure? Well, this is the one that generates pressure, the big one right here, this big old pump. So it's due to your heart contracting and relaxing that generate, or especially the contracting part, that's generating the pressure throughout your body. Now, what's this delta P? So whenever you see that chemical or that mathematical notation delta, that means some sort of difference. So the pressure gradient is a measure of overall circulatory pressure. So basically, what's the difference between the maximum pressure in your circulate in your systemic circulation and the lowest pressure? So where do you find the maximum pressure? The part that's immediately closer to the heart. So the pressure immediately, as soon as you exit the heart and end up in the aorta, that's the maximum pressure. And then the right atrium, when blood returns to the heart, that's going to have the lowest pressure. So highest pressure at the heart, and immediately when you exit the heart at the aorta, lowest pressure when you return to the heart at the right atrium. So if we use that previous graph, which showing you the average pressure across the vessels, so how do you get that pressure? You just take this. For your overall systemic pressure, take the maximum here, take the minimum here, and that is your pressure of your system. So that's the overall difference between, just, again, just when you exit the heart and just when you return to the heart. Okay, so hemodynamic resistance. So with that part, resistance is anything, and so it's a very, it sounds very abstract, and it is kind of abstract because it actually involves multiple factors. Now, I am going over time, but again, it's because I lost that additional time. Like, we gotta get through this stuff because this stuff is like classic and important, and I guarantee you'll need it in future classes if you're going to medicine. Okay, so what is resistance? So, here, resistance has, again, it sounds abstract because it involves multiple factors. So, there's something called viscosity. So, viscosity is thickness of a fluid. So, you might have heard the term blood is thicker than water. You might also say blood is more viscous than water because it's not as, it's, it's related to density, but slightly different. There's like engineering and other fluid and fluid dynamics, it's, it's something more specific with that. Like how fast or how easily something flows, that's kind of like what viscosity is. Now blood is going to be pretty much, I mean, you can do blood thinners and you can be dehydrated or hyper, or have too much hydration. But this is less of a factor. But if we're talking about viscosity, how does that affect resistance? Well, here we have two different types of liquids. One is water, the other is that very thick, and oh, I should, yeah, I should um, eliminate this next time. But same vessel, same straw. Which is easier to drink through? Or which would be easier to drink? This water over here, or if you try to drink this, like there's a reason why they provide a spoon because if you try to drink that with a regular straw it's going to collapse because you can try to do all the suction you can but you can't get it through that straw so again if you, the thicker something is the more viscous the liquid the more resistance you have so that's what i'm getting at here the more viscosity the more resistance the less flow you have through the same vessel now vessel length this is which is easier to breathe through a snorkel or if you or the garden hose, and if you tried this at home, again, don't. I wouldn't suggest using this like a, with the old garden hose with all this dust and what all sort of smuts and whatever is in there. Maybe if it's like a, if you want to try it, and again, don't do this for a long time because I don't want you to pass out. So, which is easier to breathe through? Or I think remember there, there was a show called Mythbusters, and they had it where they tried to use a really long bamboo snorkel, and they had a hard time drink or like breathing through it. So the longer a vessel, the lo harder, it's the harder, the slower, the the more resistance there is to flow through that vessel. So what happens and why is that? Well, when you have something flowing through a vessel like the blood vessels. It also has friction. So what we have here is like, okay, we have a cross section of a vessel and everything, the surface area in that provides a degree of, it slows blood, it has some drag, some friction on the blood that flows through it. But if you double the length of this vessel, what happens to that internal surface area? Double the length, you double the area. Now, this is the interesting thing about that. So we're going to double the resistance. So if you double the length, 
that's going to double the surface area, thereby doubling the friction, and friction does slow blood flow. So if you have double the length of a vessel, you have a double the resistance. So the longer the vessel, the slower the, the flow through that vessel. Yeah, so that's what we're seeing with this here. So again, just by doubling it, you slow the flow by half. Now, which is easier to drink through? Now let's talk about, instead of talking about length, let's talk about diameter. So we're looking at cross section of the vessel. Which is easier to drink through? A regular straw or a cocktail straw? Pretend it's the same. Or, well, hopefully, again, it's like if you're not of age, you shouldn't know a cocktail, or maybe you maybe you have a cocktail, but again, not endorsing that. But in case of uh, okay, regular straw versus this very thin cocktail straw, and you have the same drink, same liquid, which is easier to drink through? Well, again, it's like the small straw. This is if you want to nurse your drink, maybe ask for a co cocktail straw because it's going to have less flow. And Or what's the fastest way to drink a glass of water? Through a straw or just dump it down your gullet? Yeah, which has a wider diameter, your mouth or a straw? So the wider the diameter, the less flow or the less re resistance. So again, wider means less resistance, and the narrower, the more resistance. So what we see here is that we have a blood vessel, two centimeters in diameter, but when you half the diameter across the vessel, now you have 16 times the resistance. You may be like, wait, why isn't it two times the resistance? So this is what's very interesting. It deals with this equation called the Poise equation, and it deals with uh, something called laminar flow. Now, do I expect you to memorize this equation for at this level? In 300 level, and when you get to, if you take physics, you might have to know this and if you're engineering. But what it is, it involves this equation, and this part right here, the vessel radius, which is also related to diameter, notice that it has an exponent. So that exponent is not to the sec, it's not squared, it's not cubed, it's to the fourth power. So the Poise equation is, applies to many fields, especially medicine, like like things like blood flow through the vessels, but also through your lung, or also airflow through your lungs, IV drips or needles. Like, is it easier to put put um, or like push liquid through a small diameter needle, or a small gauge needle, or a large gauge needle? So it has a lot of applications, but what we see is that if you have our flow over here, so the wider the resist, wider the radius, the more flow we have. But if this gets smaller, that is multi that factor it gets smaller is taken to the fourth power. So that's why if we half it, it's actually what's one half times one half, one fourth. What's one fourth times itself to get that would be one sixteenth. So that's why we have 1 16th of the flow by just narrowing the radius by half.